morning, as we go to the Chumash of today, we're holding the new Pasha, Pasha Mishpatim, which is in the Exodus chapter number 21, verse number one. These are the commandments you shall put before them. Rashi says, Wherever it says, these are apostle. So it comes to, it comes to separate itself from the previous ones. When it says, and these, it comes to add. What does it come to add? Means to add that is what, what has previously been said. Thus, just as what has been said previously stated, namely the Ten Commandments from Sinai, so were these said at Sinai. Now, why is this, was this section? Why was this section dealing with the laws put together with the African, This section was put together in this in this place, now, dealing with the altar because we come. We ended off last week's portion with the law of the altar, the Mizbeach. They tell us that you shall be placed the Sanhedrin. You need to put the Sanhedrin near the altar. And that's where the, the high court was. The high court was near the altar, of the altar, the Mizbeach. I said, the Tosl of Naam, you shall put before them. And as she said, the Holy One blessed me, he said to Meshavim, do not think of saying, that I will not trouble myself to enable them to understand the reasoning for the matter or explanation. Don't think that you just leave it up to, uh, to, to them. Therefore, it said, you shall put it before them, like a table set with food and prepared to eat, placed before them, put it before them that they will, that they will be able to hear what the commandments are, understand even the commandments that could be understood, etc. Lefneim, we go now into the laws, a lot of laws between man and man, laws of money matters and life, uh, you know, murder and 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 and, and legal issues in this in this week's parsha. Lefneim, 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 lefneim. Come to tell us that, that a Jew should go to a Jewish court in money matters, but not in front of the Gentile court. Even if you know that they will, that, that the Goyish court will certainly uh, judge in a certain law similar to Jewish law. A Jew should go to a Jewish court. Do not bring it to, the, to, to their courts. But one who brings a Jewish law to be for guys, we a non Jewish court, profanes the divine name and honors the name of idols. To praise them. And it says, For not like our rock, God is their rock. And yet our enemies judge us. And we let our enemies judge us. This is testimony to our esteem of, of their deity. And therefore, we should always bring a court case that we have with a fellow Jew who are money matters today for sure in front of a Jewish court. He's sick now, even if you buy a Jewish slave. Sheshon Yavid, Sheshon Yavid, six years he shall work as a slave. Ubashvi, he ate to the Chav Shechinam, and in the seventh year he shall go out free. Now she says, a slave who is himself a Jew. Or perhaps it might mean a slave, a Jewish slave, meaning a non Jew, a Canadian servant who is brought by a Jew. And concerning him, the Tater says, he shall work for six years. How do you know it means a Jewish slave? As she says, how then can you apply the law following the verse? He shall bequeath him. Does the verse apply concerning one servant purchased from a, from a non-Jew? But one a servant purchased from a, from a Jew goes free at six years. Therefore, the Torah states, should your brother, your, a Hebrew man, be sold to you, he shall serve you for six years later on in Deuteronomy. This is a clarification that God said this only regarding your brother, the law of going out in six years is only for a Jewish slave. He says that the two ways a person can be sold in the hands of the court who sold him into servitude because he, he's a goddess. If, if the court catches a thief 
and he doesn't have any money to pay back. So the court sells him as a slave, and now he pays back to his becoming a slave. As it says, if he has no money, he should be sold to himself, or perhaps to be refers to one who sold himself into serving him. Somebody who has no money, realize he can't make a living, so he says, you know what, I'm going to sell myself as a slave, at least my, my family will have a livelihood because of poverty. But if the court sold him, he does not go out free in six years, you might say maybe the Pasuk, the verse is not talking about a person that was sold in slavery, but a person that sold himself into slavery. The Torah says, and it's your brother becomes impoverished besides you and, you, and, and, and is sold to you, one who sells oneself because of poverty is mentioned here. So to avoid repetition, I replied, you should, should you buy? I understand this concerning one who sold for the court. So if you have these two laws, somebody who sold by the court, we do to, do to uh, paying back a, a Geneva, stealing, a, a stealing something, you got to pay it back. And somebody that sells himself, there's two different kind of cases. A khafshi, what means the chafshi to freedom? In Begapa Yava, if he comes alone, Begapa Yates, he goes out alone. In Balishu, if he's a married man, the Yatsa Ishta Ima and his wife shall go out with him. Now she says, in Begapa Yava, which means he has, he's not married. Expression Begapa Yava when he's, he's, he's sort of saying in a skirt, in his cloak. Meaning that he came only with alone with his clothing, in the skirt of his garment. This tells us that if he's not married at first, his master may not give him a Canaanite servant. We know we're going to learn in a moment that the interesting Torah law, this is only a positive. Torah tells us a man that becomes a slave, the owner can give him the maidservant, the guy, a non Jewish. Maid servant to have uh, offsprings for them. But uh, that is only allowed if he's married. If he's not married, he's not, they're not, he, the master's not allowed to do this. In Bali, Shahu. But if he's married, I mean, the son of his husband, meaning an, an Israelite woman, he's married to a Jew. So his wife goes out with him. So now she says, the mother asks the question Who brought his wife? His wife is not a slave. He's a slave. Rather, the text informs us, whoever purchases a Hebrew slave also responsible for supporting his wife and children. That's what it says. If you think you're buying a slave, you're buying a, you're buying a slave, you're buying a master. So the guy sold himself as a slave or he was sold as a slave because he had no money. So now you're going to have to not only support him, you're going to have to support his entire family. And therefore, the Torah tells us that the wife cannot say, you know what? I want to continue to be supported by the master. Seems like she's a better supporter than, than my husband. Yeah. And once the uh, owner lets, lets go this Jewish slave, his wife and his children become his responsibility. Now here we have this law of, of the, the, the master is allowed to give the slave to a non-Jewish woman as a maid, one of the maids. Fascinating law. A lot of slavery today, Baruch Hashem. If the master gives him a wife and he bears him sons, or daughters, Ultimately, when he goes out in six years, all his, uh, the children that he has with this woman doesn't belong to him. But who he ate to Begapa, he goes out free. Now she says, from here we deduce, the master has the option to give the slave a Canaanite maidservant, in order to beget slaves from her. Perhaps this means only an Israelite woman Maybe the Pasuk means that he got allowed to give her a Jewish maidservant. If a third tells him the woman or children shall belong to the master. And that can only be by, by a, a, a non-Jewish slave. Thus he's speaking about a Canaanite woman. For a Hebrew woman, she also goes out of six years. And even before six years, 
when she develops signs of a puberty, she goes free. That we'll learn later. And it says a brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, that uh, one shall serve for six years. This teaches us that a Hebrew maidservant also goes out free in six years, even though it said at the beginning of the bus, it can talk about a man, but it's a man and a woman. So the most you can hire a, man, a slave for a Jewish, for the Jewish people is six years. But if you, if you buy a Canaanite slave, then, she's, then, the, then they're slaves forever. No such thing as freedom, unless they're freed. If the, if, the, if, the, if the servant says, after six years, I have to say, I like this servant. I like this maid. I have children with her. I'm also a married man. I have no children outside. But I have children over here. I don't want to have freedom. I want to stay in slavery. This maid servant, I like this maid servant. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the life I'm in. Why you let me free? I want to be, I want to be a slave. And the master brings him to the judge. Because here now he's coming. He wants to be in slavery on his own free will. I mean, in the previous to he was forced to, to be in slavery. But over here, why would he want to, why would any person after six years want to continue slavery? So therefore, you take him to the door and bring him to the bezin. The Gishala Dallas, they bring him to the doorpost. He must put an earring in his ear. And now he becomes surgeons forever. Now she says, Elakim means to the court. He must console with the seller that they sold him. The court sold him. That's what the Pasuk is talking about. The court sold him. I might think a doorpost is a qualified place which the board of servants is. Therefore, the text tells us, you shall thrust in his ear and into the door, meaning into the door, not into the doorpost. What then does the doorpost mean? The text compares the door to the doorpost. Thus, the doorpost is upright, attached to the house. Otherwise, it's not called a doorpost. So is the door upright. A detached door may not be used as this concept. But what is the concept? The right ear, perhaps it means the left one. Therefore, the Torah says, Oizay, and Oizay elsewhere. So here we have a Gizay to Shava. We have the word Oizay in one place, you have the word Oizay in another place. Gizay to Shava, which means two places, similar wording. Which indicates that the ruling pertains to one situation, also applies to the other. It states here his master shall bore his ear, Oizen. And it stated regarding the Matsaida, a Matsaida, some of him came a leper, and he goes through the laws of leprosy. Over there, also, Matsaidas, over there, it says the cartilage of his right ear. The one is becoming, you have to put blood on the cartilage of the right ear. Over there, it says openly in Leviticus. So you take the word oizen and oizen, that's a gzeda shava, that's one of the ways Torah is expanded upon. And you take the two words, even though one is written in, in Exodus and one is written in Leviticus. You put the two, took them together. Now why is the itch, uh, the, the dust took over there is the right ear? Paul success over there by the, by the leprosy, that it's the right ear. So to over here, it's the right ear. Okay, so now we know it's the right ear. Why the ear? Why do you, I mean, why do you need a, why does the, why was the whole purpose of giving this guy an earring, so to say? It's men now, so it says that the, uh, now why is the ear chosen to be born out of all organs of the body? Abiyechel Mazaki said, the ear that heard on Mount Sinai, you shall not steal. And you, what brought you about this whole thing and this, this marriage and this children? Brought about because you are a goddess, you stole, and you want to continue this slavery when you shouldn't have never stole any money. Then he went out and stole. Shall boys, he has a listening, he didn't listen. A text for, and if the text is for the one who sold himself, it's a servitude. So, why do you, he didn't steal? 
He needs money. He's a poor man. So then you should listen to the verse. The verse that said, for the children of Israel are my slaves, slaves to me. And he went down and required a master for himself. Shimon used to interpret this verse in a beautiful manner, like a bundle of pearls on a great amount, amount uh, or a great amount of perfume in this way. Why were the door and the doorpost singled out when all the fixtures of the house? The only one said, the door and the doorpost were witnessed in Egypt. And I passed over the lintel and the doorpost. I said, the children of Israel are slaves to me. They are my slaves, but they are not slaves to slaves. Yet this one went out and acquired himself a master. He's here that he shall be bored before them for everyone to see that he has given himself over into slavery. What means forever? The Rashi says forever doesn't mean forever. The Gemara. The Gemara says until the year of Jubilee. That in the year of Jubilee, every slave goes out free. Everyone goes out free. Or perhaps it meant literally forever as a parent meaning. Maybe Loyola means forever. How you know it's still, still Jubilee? Therefore, Tatar states in reference to Jubilee and man to his family shall return. This informs us that in 50 years called Eilam. So you see over there, the, the, the Pasuk used Eilam. That the, the year of Jubilee is like a, like a, like a, like a, like forever. Like, comes a concept of forever. And therefore, everything, all the properties return to the original owners, all the slaves are free, Jewish slaves, are free, etc. So the most it can be in slavery is 50 years if he sold himself at the year of, right after the year of Jubilee. If he sold himself the year before Jubilee, he's a free on the year of Jubilee. He must serve him like in the, he must serve him until the Jubilee year, regardless whether it's near or far off. Doesn't make a difference. On the year of Jubilee, the uh, slave goes free. Verse number seven, the man will sell his daughter as a maidservant. They say to contain someone who should not go free like slaves go free. This is a very fascinating law. And the reason why the Torah allowed a person to sell his daughter into slavery. Because in general, a girl shouldn't go into slavery at all. But it was for the sake of getting her married. It was one of the options, so to say, how we can get the, how they can get their daughters married. They're struggling with this issue. So with this is a very interesting law. So now if a man is very, very precise law, you have to learn the Gemara really. Hopefully we can get into Rashi, uh, what, how this law works. But to really comprehend this law, you have to learn the Gemara. So the Gemara says the scripture is referring to, to a minor girl, a girl under 12. I might think they even should develop signs of puberty that a father may sell her. But you must agree that the Kalva Chaima, the inference of a major rule to a minor rule, applies here, namely if she were already sold, goes free with signs. That is when she has signs of initial puberty, like 12 and a half years old. It's written, he shall go free from not, for, for, uh, for nothing without money. Later on, which is we interpret as proving to signs of initial puberty. Does it make sense that if she is not sold and it has initial signs of purity, she should be sold? So therefore, if she, if she goes out in purity, how can he sell her to begin with in purity? That's a kalva chayim. If she's let out free, when she, in a, when she is so signs of purity, so surely she cannot be sold. The mechilte and that's the gemara. The moment when a female has two pubic hairs, usually when she's 12 years old, He's no longer considered a minor Tana. She's called a Nada. So at 12 years old, she becomes a Nada. She is, however, still under her father's jurisdiction until six months later, when her, when her breasts develop to a certain stage. Then she's called a Burgess, a mature girl. In the case of a, of a Hebrew maid servant, the father may sell her only when she's a minor. 
not when she's a nada. So there's three parts, three times in the, in the, in the, in the by a boy, he's a cotton and a gadol. He's a, he's, a, he's a minor and he's an adult. By a girl, we have three stages. We have a katana, a nida, and a bikeness. Katana is until 12 years old. From 12 to 12 and a half, she's called a nada. And by 12 and a half, she's called a bikeness. She is a woman. She's a, an adult. It's important these stages because there's a concept of, of, of marrying off your daughter uh, in Taylor also. Here we have the law of selling your daughter. So you know how to sell your daughter till 12 years old when she's a katana. Now, why did you do that for? As the title is going to say, because you wanted to get her married to this family. It was the only way to get her into the family. So that's what the father does. So really, he could have sold her at 11 and a half. That's it. Now she has uh, six months. He has to, the, 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 the master has to do something within six months. He has to make a decision, as you'll soon see in the past. Now she says, I say, she says, this is also another law that we find the difference between a Goyish and uh, 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 the owner of a non Jewish slave and the owner of a Jewish slave. So uh, let's let's lead Ashi. It says Avadim, like emancipation of Canadian slaves who go free because of the loss of a tooth. So in Torah law, if you punch your non-Jewish slave and you knock out his tooth, he's free. Even though a non-Jewish slave is bought forever, but if you abuse him, he's free. That's the way that the Torah is going to say that explicitly. So the Torah seemingly makes the difference between a Jewish slave and non-Jewish slave. A Jewish slave goes out of six years. But a non-Jewish slave would go out if he's, if he's abused. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a stricter thing by a Jewish slave, there's a, there's a stricter thing by a non-Jewish slave. A non-Jewish slave can be a slave forever. A Jewish slave, even if somebody, even, even if the owner punches him, he doesn't go out. He goes out only at six years. Inching, this is all Torah law. You got to go into the Gemara to figure out how they learn this all from these psukim. So these, who goes free, the loss of a tooth and an eye. This is, this one, the Jewish maid it will not go free, the loss of a tooth or an eye. But she'll work, it's been six years. Or until the Jubilee year, or until she develops signs of puberty. I mean, if you sold her, sold her at six years old, then she's going to be a slave till, say, till 12 years old. She's sold for six years. So whichever one comes first, the first event affects her freedom. And a master will reimburse her for the value of the eye or the value of the tooth. So he has to pay her. He has to, uh, when he hurts your slave, you got to pay, uh, pay uh, at the end of the slave, you're going to have to pay your servant for the damages. Um, or perhaps it's not the intention of verse, but she shall go free as the male slave goes free, meaning after six years or the jubilee year, if the third stage, could your brother, the Hebrew man or Hebrew woman, be sold to you? This compares the Hebrew woman to the Hebrew man in regard to the ways he can, he can free her. Thus, as the Hebrew man goes free following six years of service or the jubilee year, so does the Hebrew woman go free following six years of service or the jubilee year. What then is the meaning? She shall go free. She shall not go free, and the slaves go free. This means she shall not go free with the loss of the tips of her limbs, as does a Canadian slave. I might think then that only Hebrew makes him and doesn't go free the loss of a tip of her limb, but a Hebrew man does go free in the loss of a tip of her limb. Therefore, the Torah compares the Hebrew man to the Hebrew woman. Just as a Hebrew woman does not go free with the loss of the tip of her limb, neither does a Hebrew man go free with the loss of the tip of her limb. So that's the way we learn one from the other. Now we go to the next verse. The Torah that tells why we even sold her as a slave. Why would you sell your young daughter as a slave? Under age, why would, you sell, why would anybody sell Tana, a young girl under 12, as a slave? Maid servant. 
She's just pleasing. She stole it for one reason. Wants to get married into this family. Not necessarily for himself, then he shall enable it to be redeemed. Shall not rule over a solitary other person when he betrays her. That's, it. That's the real reason. Betrays her. It means a guy who buys a slave knows a young girl, Jewish girl. He knows why he's buying her. The person needs to have a, this person is trying to get his daughter a shidduch, and that's the way he's doing it. And Rabbi initially, he's not trying to please to an extent that he wants to marry her. He wants to marry her, or some wants to, wants to give it to her son, son etc. He's not designated to marry her. And pay, and then the money paid for purchase, the money for betrothal. Here the scripture hints that it's a mitzvah to the mitzvah to perform you designated for marriage. And that's a mitzvah. That was the whole reason. He gave the money to the to the uh, to the father as 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 a as a wedding as a wedding, uh, as a wedding uh, betrothal. And if he doesn't do that, that's why she's not allowed to be in slavery after she becomes an adult, after she becomes a Nida and a Burgess. Either money articles value have been given to the girl's father in order to marry her. The money uh, the, the father originally received, the selling it order would now become the money of betrothal to the master. After, this means that the master should give her the opportunity to be redeemed and go for he to assist in her redemption. Now, what is the opportunity that gives it to her? And he deducts it from her redemption according to the number of years she worked for him. As if she had been hired by him and not as a slave. That's it. So, in essence, she was never, this girl was never a slave. Because that's what the, that's what the title wanted over here. That, the, that, the, that the, whoever would buy her would, 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 would want to take this poor girl out of a life of, of, of poverty and give her a good life. Marry her into the family, so and there would never be an aspect of slavery. And therefore, if he doesn't want her, he has to figure out how to make sure not to diminish diminish the value of this girl. Also, let her let let him say he bought her for a month or one hundred zoos, and she worked for him two years. He said to him, "We know that she and me uh, ultimately leave then the six years. It means that you brought her each year for one sixth of a month." Hundred dollars. Let's say it was it was uh, was uh, uh, so it's hundred twenty dollars a year. So you you deducted the whatever, accept two thirds of the money for her, and pay the remaining of the four years and let her leave. You shouldn't take this girl and have her in slavery for six years. You have to make a decision pretty quickly. If you want this girl part of your family, you don't want it. You don't want it. You have to let her free. You should let her free. I'm luckily meaning you need the master, not the father, the right to sell it to anyone else. The big day, but once you sold it once, like you're diminished, it's a terrible disgrace to this girl, and you're not allowed to do that. So if the master comes to betray her and not fulfill the commandment to, to marry her into the family and the father too, since you betrayed her and sold her this once, the so once. You sold a girl under age for that reason. And now she's let free, Baruch Hashem. And not allowed to take any advantage of her again. Baruch Hashem, we did the right thing. You designated him for your son. You can't treat her like a maid anymore. She's your daughter-in-law. Because part of your family. And she needs to be treated like part of your family. So if the master chooses a wife for her son, teach her that the son also stands in the master's place to designate her as father so desired. And not require any, another betrothal. But he can say to her, Behold, you are designated to me with the money my, your father received, original for the value. So whatever my father received is as a marriage, and I am now married to you, and you're part of this beautiful family. In sustenance, clothes, and marriage relationship, like anybody that obligates himself in marriage to his wife. 
you know, love if, if the man takes another wife from himself. Even if he takes another wife for himself, he's not allowed to diminish her sustenance, her clothing, and her marriage. He has to treat her like a regular wife. In addition to her, on his maidservants whom she has already designated, food, clothing, is physical intimacy. If he does not do these three things, doesn't give her, doesn't treat her like a wife. He goes out, she goes out without charge, without payment. Now she says, if he does not do any of these three things to her, now, what are these three things? He should designate to her for himself or for a son. Or he should deduct from the money a redemption, allow her to go free. Those are the three things. Either he marries her or her son marries her. Or he deducts the money, he lets, the three things, lets her free. But this one master designated her neither for him nor for her son and could she not be reformed to redeem herself even after deduction. Yatsachina. Text has another meaning of, of freedom. This makes it beyond what is provided for male slaves. Now, what is the meaning of this freedom? The Yatsachina informs us that she goes free when she shows any sign of puberty. And she must stay with him until she develops. And she, uh, she I'm not sorry, that she, does, she goes free when she, she, she shows the initial sign of puberty. And she must stay with him until she develops these signs. If six years pass, before the appearance of these signs, already learned that she goes free. As it says, should your brother, your Hebrew man or Hebrew woman, be sold to you, shall serve for six years. What does it mean if she shall go without charge? If the signs of puberty precede the end of the six years, she shall go free because of them, because of her signs. Perhaps it means that she goes out when she reaches maturity, 12 and a half years old. Therefore, the Torah says without payment of money, to include that her freedom at maturity, if both of them mean that she goes free without charge and without money. When not stated, and she goes out without charge was stated, I would say that she goes out without any charge, refers to being freed at maturity. Therefore, both of them are stated, so that the, this, that, that, um, that the dispute has no opportunity to differ, and he, Either one, either he, she would go out in the time of her of, her, of twelve and a half, or she goes out in time of twelve. Whatever comes first, her maturity or puberty. So maybe she wouldn't have her purity at twelve years old. You would go out. She would be allowed to walk out of this situation. So either way, the Torah gives this girl freedom. But the Torah wanted that a, a, a. It's not like a male servant. But the Torah wanted, there was the, the reason a girl was never sold because of stealing, really, per se. We hear that the purpose of the selling of this girl underage was because of marriage. Very fascinating law. You should uh, go into the Gemara and learn it over there. It goes at length. Verse number 12. Maki Ishva Meis Meis Yumas. One strikes a man and he dies. They'll be put to death, capital punishment. Makish, several verses have been written in this section dealing with murderers. And I will explain them what I'm able to explain about why these verses are needed. Why does so many times it say murderers different different ways? Makish Van Mace, why is this said? Because it says, if a man strikes down a, any human being, he shall be put to death in Leviticus. So we have a second verse that says the same thing. I understand that even if he, deal, even if he deals him a blow without death. Because there it says, he, over here it says, Maki ish mace, that a man will strike a man, he dies. Over there it says, ish kiyakal nefesh. So, if a man strikes another man, how do we know that he died? 
Here for the Torah says, so how do you put the two verses together? Here for the Torah says, he who strikes a man and he dies, meaning that he's liable only with the blow causing death. So if I hit the guy, if the ankle hits the guy with a feather and he dies, that's not a blow that caused somebody's death. So that's why it says the two, you have to hit him a strike that can kill him. If, I, if, if, if it said he who strikes a man, and I didn't say and a man strikes down a human being, I would say that he's all, one is liable only if one strikes a man. If one strikes a woman or a minor, how do we know that he's liable? So if you don't have this verse, it says, Maki Ish, I hit a man. How do I know if I hit a woman, I kill her? Tell me it's a woman that kills her. It kills a minor. How do we know? So that's why the second verse of Ayikra, it says, Iyaki Konafish, anybody. So you have two verses. Over here it says, Lamaze. Over there it's called Nefesh. Each verse teaches us something else. And from both verses, we learn out the law. And if it would say he strikes a man, and did not say he strikes down any human being, I would say he's only liable to strike him out. Right? If one strikes a woman, how do we know? If the Torah says, if a man strikes down any human being, referring to even a minor, or even a woman. Also, it says, he who strikes a man, I would understand that even a minor who strikes and kills somebody would be liable. Right? If we say the second Pasik, the ish. Therefore, the Torah simply says, if a man strikes him, make ish. The guy who's hitting has to be a man, has to be an adult. A minor is not punished. I was not given the death penalty if he kills somebody. He's a minor. Therefore, the Torah says, if a man strikes down, not a minor who strikes somebody down. Also, if strikes down any human being, implies that even novel, a non-viable infant, whole nefesh. And so if a man kills a child under 30 days, Considered a murderer, even though until 30 days, according to Torah, we don't consider this child. Maybe this child won't survive. That's where you do a pigeon aben after 30 days. David Dorothy strikes on a man, implying one is liable, one who strikes in viable, one who's capable of becoming a man. I'm sorry. So, therefore, the Torah actually says the opposite. I might think that even if an adult hits a child under 30 days, he gets the death penalty. No, he doesn't. He only gets a death penalty if he, he strikes a child, kills a child past 30 days. And I mean, and there, and that's death penalty. Under 30 days, it's not the death penalty. Verse 13, one stalks, did not stalk it. Here we're talking about, so the previous verse is talking about intentional murder. Over here, the plastic is talking about a non-intentional murderer. So, Hashalot Sida, Veloy Arab, Veloy Niskaven, he did not lie in wait. He did not, uh, he did not, uh, he did not uh, go and, and, you know, scout him. Lakim Ililiyad, and so to say, God brought it to his hands. Samtil Chamaka Mashiach, son, I'll give you a place to run. And how she said, he's not lying wait, he did not intend to kill him. Sada, the expression of lying in wait. Somebody's going out to uh, hunt. This is not scripture, we're only talking. Sada, my soul takes him. So, how is it possible the word Sada expression related to hunting an animal? One who hunts, it's called a tsai. So, we're talking about somebody who's. Uh, Let's go to the next, next Rashi. This is all grammar. Velakim ilaliyade, meaning made it ready for him. Is an expression similar to no harm will be prepared to Una. To Una is an accident. No wrong shall be, be prepared, you Una. 
and he's preparing himself misana against him, meaning that he's prepared himself to find a pretext against him. Now, why should this go out from before him? That's what David said as a proverb to the ancient one. And the wicked comes out from forth wickedness. Proverbs, the ancient one is the, one is the tailor, which is the proverb of the Holy One, blessed be he. Who is the ancient one of the world? Now, where did the Torah say that the wicked comes from wicked, that wicked comes from wickedness? This refers to but God brought it, it to his hand. So what is the text referring? Two people. One who killed unintentionally, and one who killed intentionally. But there was no witnesses who would testify to the matter. So the guy is getting away with it. This one who killed intentionally was not ex executed. The one who killed unintentionally was not ex exiled. With no witnesses. So the Holy One, blessed me, he brings them both into one in. God makes sure they go on vacation to one place. The one who killed him unintentionally is ascending a ladder. And he falls off on the one who killed intentionally. And he kills him. Ah, now there's witnesses. And the witnesses testify about the sentence, and now they force him into exile. Because we have witnesses who saw that he killed unintentionally. And the guy who intentionally killed, they able to kill him. Doesn't get away with murdering somebody that he got away with it, they didn't have any witnesses. Abish is a witness, ultimately, and, saw, and knows that the guy killed somebody intentionally. So that's what we mean. God brings it to your head. So therefore, we learn from here that, they, that wickedness comes from the wickedness. Not that a person can kill unintentionally. God doesn't, uh, wouldn't bring about that this person should kill somebody else. If not, that he, he hasn't done truth, he hasn't gone to the city of refuge. Even in the desert, the Jews made a city of refuge. Where the men who has murdered shall flee. And what place afforded is asylum? This was the camp of Levi, was the city of refuge. So this is the law of an unintentional murder. And we have other psukim in the Torah talking about unintentional murders, murderers. Santa Lacham. Verse number 14. If he has a man plots deliberately against his friends, slay him with cunning. Even from my altar, you should take him to God. So this again, another verse about a murderer. Ash says, why is it said? Because it said, one who strikes a man shall surely put to death. So why do you need to have this verse? I mean, stand is to apply to a physician who kills a patient. Or the agent of court who killed by administrating 40 lashes. Father who strikes his son, the teacher who disciplines his pupil, and the, un the uh, unintentional killer. Therefore, the Torah says, if the man plotted deliberately, can't, cannot, cannot judge a person that's a doctor, and, he, and, 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 and his patient dies underneath him. Or the court guy who gave the extra lash, and, or in the lashes that he gave, and the, and the person died. That's not called yazid. Yazid means deliberately, unless you can prove that they deliberately wanted to kill the person. And that's what the pastor wants to tell us. That's what we all want to teach. I mean, a teacher strikes the student. He dies, unless you know that he deliberately wanted to do that. So that's what's called in the Torah, amazing. Intentional murder, yazid. Same word as amazing, a person who intentionally, deliberately, consciously has an agenda to murder. And that's why we learn that, you know, you have to, there has to be warning before a person murders, it has to be. It's not so simple to, 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 um, 
to, uh, to make somebody amazed, to bring from the court that the person intentionally won't, how do you prove intentions? Him is even if he was a koyin. But right to love and avoid it. He says, oh, let me do the service. You take him from there. Verse number 15. Maka of Vima. One strikes his mother or his father. Maisyumas. This is not even with death. Since we learned that one who strikes one's fellow is liable to make monetary uh, uh, compensation, he's not liable to death. Texts have to state that one who strikes his father or his mother, the penalty is death. But he's only liable except for a blow that causes a wound. Either this one or that one doesn't make a difference. He punched his mother and he made her black and blue. Most humans bechenek is trying to research. The Gemara says the parents should be very careful not to anger their children. Because they can bring them chas v'shalem to this verse. Maka of the ima most humans. Verse number 16, the Gainish Machari. If whoever kidnaps a man and sells him, Benimps of Yadin and he's found in his possession, Oisumas, kidnapping is punished by death. Mama Nama, why is this said? Since the law of kidnapping is mentioned elsewhere, go to Deuteronomy, Shnami Kimatsi, he's going never to Machov, it's late in Deuteronomy, and a man found stealing a person. Amongst his brother, meaning the children of Israel, they worked with him. He sold him. Thief shall die, and you shall clear away the evil from your midst. So why do you need to have this verse? From here, I know only that a man who kidnaps a person is liable to death. How do we know if a woman, one who's a intermediate sex or hemophilia, kidnap a person who are liable to death? Therefore, the Torah says, whoever kidnaps a man and sells him. And since it says here, whoever kidnaps a man, I know only that one who kidnaps a man is liable to die. How do you know he kidnaps a woman? He's liable to die. Therefore, the Torah says in Deuteronomy, stealing a person. Therefore, both of these verses we need, for one verse left out and the other verse left in, we need to have both of these verses again. You can go to the Gemara, Sanhedrin, where the Gemara said, takes these two verses, puts them to face to face, and what you learn. From both of these verses. Nimsa the Biyade, what means the Nimsa Biyade means that the witness saw him and he kidnapped him and sold him. And he kidnapped the man was found in his hands prior to most Yunas Bechana by strangulation. Here we learn Ash says every every death penalty mentioned in Torah without qualification is strangulation. But it interrupts the subject of discussing sins against parents and rights. Whoever kidnaps a man between the verses, one who strikes his father and mother, and one who curses his father and mother. Here's to me, that's next verse 17. And it's underlying reason for the controversy, controversy found in Sanhedrin. That one Tanuk master believes that we are we're comparing striking somebody to cursing. Just as one liable only for curses the person who keeps the commandments as we fit every Jew, so to one's liable only striking a person. Keeps the commandments, but not for striking a kutit. The other master believes that we not compare cursing to striking. And the one who's liable for striking a kutit, even though does not keep the commandments. You can see the Gemara deal will explain because we go from the verse number 50, talks to you about your father and mother. Verse number 60 talks about a general rule of, of kidnapping. Verse number 17 goes back to your father and mother. And why do we put, why does the Torah put this verse right in the whole machlek is the Gemara? Do we compare hitting to, cur- to cursing or there's a different law by hitting and cursing? One who curses his father or mother, he put to death. Now she says, What does it say? Since scripture says any man, any man who curses his father, 
says that in Leviticus. Again, we have a lot of time in Torah. Folks, says it again. So why do you need both verses? From here, I know only if a man curses his father, he's liable to How do we know if a woman curses her father? She's liable to that. Therefore, scripture there says, anyone who curses their father, it makes no, it makes an unqualified statement, either whatever the man or woman. If so, why does it say in any man? So why does it say the word over here? Over there later, why does it say a man? So over there comes to tell us and exclude a minor, meaning underage. Mice, you must. Hirab says, Meskila, because that's in, the, in, in Leviticus. If we did, the title tells you the punishment. But Maka, whatever the blood is upon him, is Meskila. And that's dumb above. That's the, the verse of Leviticus, the model of the other The model, all of them is rock shall be stoned them. Their blood is upon them. God, in the one who curses his father, it says his blood be upon him. So whenever it says, Meskumas, Anglization. Come above, skillers, stony. Verse number 18. Two men are having a fight. One man strikes his friend. The Evan, the stone. With a fist. And he's not going to die. Hashem, you didn't kill him. And not for the Mishka, but he falls to, he's, he got sick. He now he's in the hospital and he's going to have to have re recuperate. Hashem says, why does it say this? Since it says later, an eye for an eye, we learn only that if, that if one assaults his fellow, he must pay the value of his limb. He amputated, rendered permanently useless. Payment for idleness and healing, we have not yet learned. Therefore, this section, which delineates these payments, was stated. So we know in Jewish law, there's Nezek, Tsar, Lepoi, Shabbos, Boishas. Five payments for a damage when you hurt somebody. Nezek, the payment of the damage. Tsar, the payment of the pain. Dipui, the doctor's payments, Shabbos, that he can't go to work, and Boishas, the embarrassment. You embarrass this guy in public. Nafal and Mishkav, as she says, he's, he's, he's an illness that prevents him from working. Yaakov Mechisal Abilchutz Al Mashante, if he gets up and walks outside on his support, and Nika Amaka, and the assailant, and, 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 he's, and he, got, uh, he got healed, Baruch Hashem. He shall give his payments for his idleness, and he shall provide his cure. Now she says, I'm a Shantal, Baruch Hashem, he got healthy, back to his friend. Now what would enter the mind of one who did not kill shall be killed. Now the Torah teaches here that if he that they imprison him until he becomes a parent, wherever this one, the victim will get well. And this is the meaning when one gets up and walks on his support, the assailant shall be cleared. But before his victim gets up, the assailant shall not be cleared because the person might die. If the person dies, then you're going to be put to death. Dak shiftai, which shiftai? Enforced idleness from his work is due to the illness. He cut off his hand or his foot. We assess the payment of the idleness as if he was a watchman of a cucumber field. Because even after he recovers from his illness, he's not fit to work. That requires a hand and a foot. And the assailant already gave his payment for the damage of value of the hand and the foot. So, how do you evaluate do you the value? So, you, you evaluate what the person. And not do now, and, and basically, we're going to give him that payment. As Tiger Munkulus Rendus, he shall pay the physician's fees. He's obligated to pay all the fees of his 
doctor fees, hospital fees, etc. Oh, that finishes the Shrita as the Chumash of today. Long Chumash, as you can imagine, it's a lot of Gemara, a lot of Gemara. My friends, we started chapter 26 of Tanya. Very powerful chapter in many, many ways. And the, uh, in the Alter Rebbe started off yesterday with the concept of Simcha. With the aspect of joy and the obligation of a Jew to be joyful in any situation. And now that I've said that sadness brings to nothing. Nobody gains out of sadness. The only gains out of sadness is that there's happiness after the sadness. If there is joy after the sadness, then the sadness has value. If sadness has no joy after it, there's no value in sadness. And the, a Jew. And a surely a Bainani needs to needs to get away from any kind of sadness. And now Tareb is going to go through. He's going to go through different kinds of sadness. He's going to talk something very hard to hear right now, because this is sadness of pain of sad sadness in this world, and it may be personal sadness. And it's very hard sometimes to be happy when a person is going through personal painful situations in life. He is out there. He's going to tell a person. He's going to tell him the truth. And really, the truth is what a person has to say to himself. So we see from the above the importance of serving God with joy. Yet many things in one's life, both physical and spiritual, may cause him sadness. Dr. Rebbe now goes on to propose the means of combating the sadness so that one may always be joyful. And the Eitzah, you tell the leave him a call sound advice of being offered by our sages to cleanse one's heart from all sadness. And any trace worry, and any trace of worry, we are Eitzah with another with Daiga about mundane matters. I feel a bit even sadness and worry caused by the lack of essentials of children, health, and livelihood. It should be known to everyone the statement of Rabbi Seinu, the final bracha, the statement of our sages. Just like a Jew should thank God for the good, so he must thank God for misfortune. And that's a harsh, that's a doubt that doesn't even want to say, he writes for Chulu, etc. Doesn't want to end the Gemara. The Gemara says, just like you thank God for the good, you have to thank God for the bad. You have to push, thank God. We make a bracha, chas v'shom, somebody dies, you make a bracha, baruch to bless you, God, the dynamics, you true judge. You're thanking God. Peter speaks Gemara. And the Gemara said, when you see a bracha, a bracha is not said in sadness. A bracha, you're thanking God. How can you thank God in sadness? If you're thanking God, then you have to be besimcha. The Gemara explains that this does not mean that he recites the same blessing. The blessing is a case of misfortune, God forbid, and blessing of God and two judge, rather than implication that one should accept the misfortune with judge, with joy. Like joy in a visible and obvious good. <laughs> it is tough. The Gemara. In essence, telling you, you have to be happy. Went through a tragedy. How can he be happy? Mother says you have to be happy. How are you happy? Gams at the table because this is also really good. This is good. Actually, Nicholas, we need to slay the bus. The only problem is you'll see the good. Give a mile now, I'm going because this. Comes from the world, the hidden world. Lamaila Mama's God, which is higher than the revealed spiritual world. And that's where you cannot see it. And after that, gives us a, it gives us its source in Kabbalah. Shuvav Mishem Avayi Baruchu. The latter emanates with the letter Vav from the, from, uh, Vav and the Hey of the uh, Avayi, the four letters of God composed of Yud K, Vav K. 
Well, the former derived from the letter Yud Hey. So Alma Discassia, Alma Discassia comes from the letter Vav Hey. And Alma Discassia comes from the letter Yud Hey. That's your custom, and that's what the verse says. Asher Gev, happy is the man whom you, God, chase, chase, chase. Yes, then. Asher Gev, Yud Kei. A Jew, what great is a person that can see that even if God chastens him, God, God punishes him, when God brings him solace, it comes from Yud Kei, it comes from comes from the Almadis Hasi, comes from the hiddenness of God. He sees the good. Man sees misfortune only because he cannot perceive that which derives from the higher, hidden levels of godliness. In truth, however, the misfortunes are actually blessings in disguise. On the contrary, they represent even a higher level of good. Then revealed good, since they originate in the higher world. And listen to the next words. It's going to be hard to listen. And therefore, our sages said, Those who love him shall, the verse says, those who are happy with pain, those who love him shall be, shall be as the sun when it comes out from the smite. It refers to the reward of those who rejoice in their affliction. God always rewards the man measure for measure. In conjunction then between rejoicing in affliction and the sun. Also, why are, the, why are those who rejoice in affliction inscribed to those who love God? Well, that now explains that since before, misfortune is really nothing but a disguise for a higher form of good that derives from the hidden world, the option as to whatever it will bring man either joy or misery depends on his priorities. If he deems his physical life all important, he will indeed be miserable. Well, if his nearness to God is his primary concern, he will rejoice. Since the nearness to God is found in greater measure in the hidden world, when it arrives the good that's hidden in this misfortune. Those who rejoice in suffering are therefore called lovers of God. They are rewarded for being granted the vision of the sun emerging in light. Since in this world they discard the external and ignore the veil of misfortune hiding the good within, choosing instead to concern themselves with the depths, deep aspects of good and godliness that lie behind the veil. God rewards them in the world to come measure for measure by casting off the veil that surrounds them him and reveal himself in the full glory to those who love him. Four letters of the divine name signify God in his essence as compared to the sun. The name of Akim signifies God as clothed and concealed in the created universe compared to the veil, the shield, the created beings for the intensity of its ray. As it's written, a sun and a shield respectively as Hashem and Hashem Alekim. The world to come, the sun will emerge from the shield. Meaning, the four letters of the name will no longer veil by Elikim, will shine forth in the might as a reward for those who love him. This is a summary explanation contained in the following paragraph. For one's joy and affliction. Then for the fact that being near to God is dearer to him than anything of life in this world. That's what he said in the morning. I love God and he takes my soul, he takes everything from me. I love the Abish. That's more important to me than anything that's happening in the world. 
And we're talking about even to me. As it says, your loving kindness is better than life. And the nearness to God is infinitely greater and more sublime in the hidden worlds. For there the concealment of the powers lodges. He says, what do I care about the revealed world? What do I care that I don't see goodness in the revealed worlds? I'm, I'm searching the hidden worlds. I'm searching the essence of God. But it's written, the most high abides in secrecy. So both of these verses indicate that the hidden worlds contains a higher aspect of godliness than revealed worlds. So the, since the hidden worlds is a source and uh, a source of seeming afflictions, he who loves God rejoices in it. For it represents a greater nearness to God than the revealed worlds, which derive from the revealed worlds. And therefore, he says, I am in love with the Abishta, the way God is in the hidden worlds, the way we cannot see the good, seemingly. It seems like maybe it's coming out in a negative way, but everything is good. Nothing negative comes from above. That's why those. Nobody should have to go through this, but those who take pain with joy will merit the sun coming out in the strength. Which is the sun coming out from the sheep. Which was hidden in this world. And the world to come, this revelation will be shined. China's all this gala alma discuss, then will reveal the hidden worlds. The Yizach Riyar Begili, it will shine forth with a glow and a great and intense revelation. The Chala Chrisim Bay Baylam Azeh, whoever seek refuge in him in this world, taking shelter in a shadow, to take shelter in the shadow of God, to accept with joy. Whatever the Abishta gives us, which is we say that you know, we take we take shelter in God's shadow because it's only a shadow, not the revealed light. The Dilemaven, the meaning of those who find shelter and refuge, even in which represents an external appearance of shade and darkness, where in the light a goodness is tamed is concealed. If we do that now, we go into the shelter of God that even we see harshness, sadness, but we are still joyful because we realize everything is Menashe Shemayim. Everything comes from heaven. And every, everything comes from heaven. It's really good. Even though I don't see it, my good, but it's really good. And even though I'm in pain, I'm really I'm, I'm happy that God is doing what he's doing because it's really good. And one day I will see the good. Dialogue Maven, and this is sufficient explanation for the understanding, which is tough to understand. Turn to Alijo points up, understood out to that bit, and this is talking each person to yourself, and you need you need to ultimately come to that that trance to yourself. Not everybody's capable of handling this 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 concept. But the Alter Rebbe is talking to each individual that they, do, they should come to their MS to realize in themselves that they should be joyful. And therefore, we know in Taylor, you, you cry for other people's pain. You shouldn't, per se, cry for your own pain. You should be happy. Accept it. Be happy. And realize that everything is good. But never accept somebody else's pain. You should cry and scream out to God for somebody else's pain. To turn to our original point, one considers that whatever appears as suffering is actually a higher form of good. You will no longer be saddened or worried by it. Why we can come to that kind of a level. We can understand this concept. It's death. It's a very powerful chapter in Tanya, and, and it started yesterday, and uh, 
and you need to read this chapter, especially those that struggle in, the, in, 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 their, in their lives with real issues and sad in their lives. If they would read this Tanya, I know that I've told people to do that, to read this chapter a couple of times. Read it, read it once. After that was, imagine sitting by the Alter Rebbe. That's what the Alter Rebbe said at the beginning of the Tanya, that, uh, that I'm, that's like a yechidus. I'm, I'm, I, I know you, I care for you, and I'm telling you something here that's the truth. And, and if you would just uh, read it a couple of times and understand it, and uh, it will ultimately resonate by you, this concept. I know it's a tough issue to, uh, to hear and to accept, but it's the truth. And uh, sometimes that's hard in our lives to do. Today is the 21st day of the month. In Tilim, it's chapter 104 and 105. Talking about tragedies, there was a tragedy that happened in, in Boca yesterday. And a colleague of mine lost his daughter, Rabbi Moskowitz, from the, the Boker Ton Synagogue. Lost his daughter to a sickness, battling a sickness for a couple of years already, a nine-year-old girl. Funerals today. And uh, I'm going to be going to the funeral, so therefore, there's no uh, class today. And Tanya, I apologize. And um, they should console the beautiful family, their son. And uh, we should... Enough is enough. Mashiach should come. And uh, we should get to Ran Sheikh now for all the sadness, Scotch, and wipe away the tears from all our faces. And we should only have simchas. Wish you all a good day, a wonderful day. In the midsham, I'll see you tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. We'll continue the chitas. Have a wonderful day.